A hundred years ago, the world's largest telescope was the great reflector set up by the third Earl of Ross at Burr Castle in Ireland. The telescope was completed in 1845, and we're going to talk about it in this evening's Sky at Night. A statue of the third Earl has been set up at Burr. And recently, at Burr Castle, I was a guest of the present Earl and Countess of Ross. Burr was a functional castle until relatively modern times. The present Earl and Countess have taken the greatest care to see that nothing of Burr's magnificent astronomical history is lost. During the 17th century, it was the scene of two sieges and its history was somewhat disturbed. But in 1800, the second Earl, who'd been a very important figure in Irish politics, retired from the political scene. Uh, he was a very strong opponent of the Act of Union and he spent the rest of his life at the castle, which he renovated very thoroughly. He died in 1841, and it was his son, the third Earl, who was the first of the two great astronomers. Oh, great, 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 Yes, the Well, so this is the monster. And this is that form steps to the other side, you see. Yeah. I see, it's an amazing thing. You see, to think that a hundred years ago it was the biggest in the world. Mm. Quite incredible, isn't it, now? Quite amazing. What kind of a person was your great-grandfather? He must have been a very remarkable man in many ways. He was not only a great scientist, but he was obviously a very much liked man, in fact, even a lovable man. Both that applies to his family and to friends. But as regards his scientific attainments, I believe as great an achievement as anything he discovered with the telescope was the fact that he was his own engineer yes. and that he cast the speculum was responsible for all the uh, detailed work without any technician. Well, because I'm used to thinking of glass mirrors that don't need attention very often, comparatively speaking. But I imagine that with a vast metal mirror such as this one, uh, maintenance was very much of a problem. I believe it was, because between main observations, the speculum had to be taken back, and it weighed a very, very large amount, to the workshops. And they are polished up laboriously. How often did this have to be done, in fact? Once a month or so? I believe it did. And, in fact, I've got an interesting document of uh, my great-grandfather's where he wrote down for the future precise directions on telescope maintenance. And that, of course, is one of the most important items. I imagine that when Burr was a great astronomical centre, all kinds of people came here to confer. Yes, you've got uh, scientists and uh, mere tourists from all over the world, not only Europe, Americans, even from Russia, there was one very regular correspondent in, in Russia at an uh, observatory there. It was often used in, for demonstrating its size for people to either stand in or sit in. I can show you several fascinating groups of all, all of people you'd think very unsuitably dressed for astronomical um, observations. There's one particular one, too, which is a great interest because it shows Dr. Berdica, who was my grandfather's resident astronomer, with an enormous black beard. Do you remember Dr. Berdica yourself? Yes, I do, quite well. He was here until the middle of the First War, when um, spy mania sent the poor man back to Germany. He was, in fact, the last official astronomer at... He was at the last the official astronomer, because don't forget, there was the Civil War immediately after yes. that war, and that, I'm afraid, is responsible for all the pulleys and yes. uh, woodwork having to be pulled down because it had become positively dangerous by then. Quite obviously, these walls imposed a very great limitation on the amount by which you could swing the telescope to either side of the meridian. At seven degrees, I believe, to either side. But what about the patterns of them? Where, was this deliberate? I can see they, they look as if they blend in with the landscape. Was this done simply and merely for, for the effect? Undeniably, it was. And I think you wouldn't have got that 20 or 30 years later. And probably it was my great-grandmother's influence that um, made my great-grandfather gothicize the front of the uh, telescope. Looking at the telescope now, when it's more or less in a horizontal position, I find it a bit difficult to visualize what it must have looked like when pointing, well, pretty well straight upwards. Was it, in fact, as difficult to use as some people have said? It w must have been extremely complicated, certainly to an amateur like myself. To begin with, it was extremely heavy yes. and cumbrous, uh, there was no, uh, no automatic machinery. Everything had to be worked by hand, by a, a sort of elaborate system of uh, winches and weights, 
which were carried into great holes on either side of these walls. So the telescope was literally pulled up on, on, on winches, really? Yes, it was, quite literally, and there was this a whole team of men who had always to be in attendance when it was to be in use. Uh, how exactly did the astronomer look through it? I mean, uh, how did he get up to the position of the eyepiece, which obviously must be at the top of the tube? Well, there was a sort of wooden platform which he could get in and out the whole way up, you see. Yes. Because the staircase went right up to the top of the west wall. Yes. And there was a gallery along the top of that. And there was another staircase going inside this wall. And so you could get in and out of your platform at any moment. I see. And you look through the rectangle down at the speculum at the base of the machine. I think you know that when you have that kind of mechanism uh, worked manually, it's really rather amazing that with a small field, he, uh, Lord Ross could in fact see these distant objects well enough to draw them as well as he did. Uh, well, I've often thought it quite extraordinary. And there is the Irish climate, which he had to contend with, too. Yes, but he certainly did it most successfully. Mm -hmm. When did all this come to an end? Because there must be people alive who still remember it. I believe that the telescope had fulfilled its useful life, by and large, when my great-grandfather died. But it was used for showing to interested spectators, for demonstration purposes, shall we say, until my grandfather's death in 1908. Bearing in mind the time when it was built, the achievements of this Ross 72-inch reflector are quite remarkable. Remember, it was ready in 1845, and the mirror, which is six feet across, which is, and, and, and that's my height, very much larger than anything previously built, was optically good by the standards of the time. It was made of a speculum metal, which is an alloy, and it was actually the last really big speculum metal mirror ever made, because after that, people went over the glass. And it's rather interesting, too, that no larger mirror was actually made until the Mount Wilson 100-inch, and that went into action during the First World War. The Ross mirror had to be repolished every month, and that was quite a job. The whole thing needed a lot of maintenance, and the third Earl left very detailed instructions of just how this was to be done. The fourth Earl continued the observations with the big telescope for some time, and I think it's probably true to say that the most important work by the big 72-inch was done in the first period of its career. Its great strength lay in its light-gathering power, which was very much greater than any other telescope made up to that time. Remember, what you want to do in astronomy is to see very faint things. And to see very faint things, you need to collect as much light as you can get. And the bigger the mirror, well, the more light you can correct. And this is where the big Ross mirror came in. With the 72-inch eye, the third Earl looked at those strange misty patches in the sky uh, known as nebulae. No one at that stage knew quite what they were, and no one had ever really seen their shapes, because to see the shapes, you do need tremendous light grasp. Well, with this telescope, Lord Ross could do that, uh, and he did. And he found out that these nebulae, or many of them, were in fact shaped like spirals, like tremendous Catherine wheels. And this was a completely new discovery. It was also one of the early indications that these things aren't contained in our own Milky Way, but are in fact a long way out beyond our own particular star system in space. For a long time, only the Ross telescope could show the spiral nature of these galaxies. And so in fact, if you wanted to see a spiral galaxy, well, you just had to come here to Burr Castle. You couldn't see it from anywhere else. And in fact, in astronomical history, there have been three great telescopes which have altered the entire course of astronomical thought. The latest of them is the 200-inch at Palomar. Before that, there was the 100-inch at Mount Wilson. And the first of the line was the 72-inch here at Burr Castle. There was another point, too. Remember, this was before the days of accurate astronomical photography, so you couldn't really photograph the spiral galaxies. So you had to draw them. And this is where the 72-inch again came in. And luckily, Lord Ross himself was a very skillful artist, and he made drawings of these things, and some of those drawings still exist here in the library at Burr Castle. Reproductions of them went all over the world. And really, you know, when you come down to brass tacks, this is the beginning, really, of all modern cosmology, because it was only then that we really found out just what these things looked like. Of course, there was other work, too, and in particular, the fourth Earl of Ross concentrated upon the moon to a large extent, and he was a member of a commission which was set up for mapping the moon accurately. In point of fact, it never really got very far, but it, 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 it was an encouraging start. This is um, uh, an instrument for measuring the heat of the moon, and it was used by the fourth Earl of Ross. 
quite obviously, it's not a very easy ma matter to measure the heat coming to us from the moon because it's so slight that you can't feel it. Anyone can feel the heat of the sun. In fact, I can feel it at this very moment on my hand coming through the glass roof. But the moon is a very different matter. And the tiny amount of heat that is sent to us is extremely difficult to measure. You need something pretty sensitive. And until the time of the fourth Earl of Ross, it had never been done. What he did, in effect, was to construct this instrument, which has a large mirror that you can see. The mirror is still in quite good condition. He collected the moon's light and therefore the moon's heat and focused this on a delicate electrical appliance that he perfected himself and he was able to get measurements by an electric current of the tiny amount of heat sent to us from the moon. And he drew up graphs of that and we've got these here. These are the original ones drawn by the fourth Earl and they show quite clearly the amount of heat that is sent to us by the moon, which of course you cannot feel. And this, in turn, is a key to the moon's surface temperature, which is a very important matter nowadays. Well, this was a great scientific triumph at the time. It was quite unconfirmed. It remained unconfirmed for a very long time. But when, later on, more accurate measurements were made with even more sensitive de uh, devices, well, it was found that the fourth Earl of Ross was pretty well right. There's one final point about all this. The third Earl of Ross single-handed built the largest telescope in the world and used it to make hitherto undreamed of discoveries. Such a thing can never happen again because we live in an entirely different kind of age. And I think, therefore, all the more honor to the memory of this great astronomer who died a hundred years ago.